Hey, could I ask everybody to stand? We have not actually um, intentionally greeted each other this morning, so I want you to do something. I want you to look around right now, find one person in this room that you don't know, and I guarantee you, you can do that. When you find that person, go and introduce yourself. You got 90 seconds. people and all these people thirty seconds ten seconds. Okay, 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 we can. Yes. So, um, we're going to have this block party after the service. You can go and carry on those conversations with these new people that you just met. Um, but I want to I begin this morning by talking a little bit about church etiquette. Can we do that? Talk a little bit about church etiquette? So, when, what, is, what is an appropriate greeting for someone you know when you see them in church? Hey, how you doing? Give them a hug, right? What is an appropriate greeting for someone you don't know when you meet them in church? Hi, how you doing? Give them a hug. Maybe not. Um, so, so, how many of you are familiar with the name Emily Post? Okay, Emily Post was kind of the etiquette guru a hundred years ago. I mean, literally a hundred years ago. So in 1922, she wrote this. She had this advice for greeting people in church. Here's what she said. People do not greet each other in church except at a wedding. It would be shocking to enter a church and hear a babble of voices. How would she do with us? <laughs> she says, ordinarily in church, if a friend happens to catch your eye, you smile, but never actually bow. <laughs> you do not greet anyone until you are out of the church on the church steps when you naturally speak to your friends and Hello should not be said on this occasion because it is too familiar for the solemnity of church surroundings. Now, with all due respect to Ms. Post, I think we can throw out that rule, don't you think? Because we want to be a place where everybody is welcome. 
And we want to be a place where significant relationships are, are developed. And that's why often when we share the Lord's Supper, when we come to the table, if there's somebody at the table we don't know, we actually introduce ourselves at the table because it, it's supposed to be family around that table. Um, so our culture's a little bit different than the one that Ms. Post wrote about in 1922. So I think we need to come up with a few new rules of church etiquette, okay? So how about this one? Sometimes people accidentally leave their cell phone in ring mode in church, uh, or maybe not accidentally, they just leave it in ring mode. Are we okay with that? Is that good? Not good? Not so good. All right, so how about this? If anyone's phone goes off during service, that person has to order pizza for everybody in church that day. Good rule? Okay. Okay. Everybody check your phone right now. It could be costly. Um, In some churches, a guest will arrive and they will ask a longtime attendee uh, about some area of ministry, like maybe the children's ministry, and they will say, hey, where is the children's ministry? And sometimes this long-timer will just point to a door and say, oh, it's over there. Is that okay? No. So how about this? If you get asked where the children's ministry is, you say, hey, let me show you, let me take you to that place. Or if you don't know, you say, hey, let's, let me go introduce you to someone who knows where that is, and either they or I will take you to that place. Good rule? Okay. Okay. Um, Sometimes during, you know, the praise time or or during the sermon, I've actually been told that some people will be checking their Facebook account. Is that okay? No. The only Facebook in here should be your face in the good book, okay? That's... Good rule? All right. Now, the reason I bring all of this up is because one day Jesus decided to introduce a new etiquette in worship. And this one teaching rocked people's worlds. And it still does. For some folks here this morning, this is going to lead to some super hard conversations, and yet it will be incredibly liberating. You see, we're in this series called Free, in which we've been looking at uh, what it means to live in the freedom that Jesus came to give us. Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he said, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And what we've talked about in this series, and if you haven't been with us, you can go back and listen to the podcast, but we've talked about the fact that freedom really is about choices. And, and we, some choices we make are more life-giving, and some choices we make are less life-giving, and, and some choices actually move us into the kingdom of light, which is God's kingdom, and some choices move us into the kingdom of darkness, which is the domain of the enemy. And today we've come to this choice that I'm calling flight versus fight, Um, and which we're going to talk about, as Andy kind of shared his story, we're going to talk about dealing with conflict. Now, we talked about conflict a couple of months ago in our Life Hacks series, but I wanted to to address it again because this is a really important topic when it comes to living free. See, so many of us walk around in life while we're in conflict with someone, and that is bondage to our soul. 
And the only way we can really live in the freedom that Jesus came to give us is to deal with that conflict. Conflict is all around us. It's unavoidable. But if you carry it around with you, it will suck the life right out of you. Now, for most of us, we have a tendency when we have conflict, we have a tendency to avoid it. How many of you just love conflict? One person. Justin, you and I are going to talk later. <laughs> you and I are going to throw down later. That's what we're going to do. Most of us hate conflict. And so what do we do? We avoid it. That's the flight option. Um, but what I'm going to propose to you is that the more freeing option is actually to fight. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Keith, you want us to fight? Well, yeah, but not in the way maybe you're thinking about fight because, see, Webster defines fight in this way. Um, fight is to contend in battle or physical combat, especially to strive to overcome a person by blows or weapons. That's what we think about when we think about fighting. We want to overcome, and if I have to come to blows with you or pull out a weapon, I'm going to do that. But there's a second definition of fight in Webster, and it's this, to put forth a determined effort. See, that's what I want us to talk about this morning, that we need to put forth a determined effort in conflict, an effort that leads to health and life and freedom. Now, I hope that you are not in conflict right now, that all your relationships are just rocking along. But here's the thing. Sooner or later, you will be in conflict. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is so important. Let me start by defining conflict this is how Ken, Ken Sandy defines it in his book, The Peacemaker. And, and uh, I've referenced this book, I don't know how many times over the last months, but if you haven't read this yet, read it. Cindy says, Sandy says, conflict is a dif difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. Conflict is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals or desires. Now, that's a really broad definition, and it can cover anything from where you go to dinner to suing somebody in court. So with that in mind, I want us to think for a moment about this new rule of church etiquette that Jesus introduced. In Matthew chapter 5, the, the text that Andy referenced in his, in his testimony, in verse 23, Jesus says, essentially, let's say you come to worship God and you have a gift that you are bringing to him and you're approaching the altar. This is a holy moment. It's an important moment. But while you're doing that, you remember that there is a relationship in your life that's kind of broken. You've said something, you've done something, you've sent a text, you've dropped a one-liner. Um, you've done something that has frustrated someone's goals or desires, and it's not resolved. What do you do? Well, rabbis in Jesus' day used to debate this. They would argue over whether, over whether or not if you've started one duty, you should leave that duty and go do something else. And they said the only time that you should stop one thing and do something else is if that something else was more important, had a greater priority than the thing you were presently doing. So coming and worshiping God, giving a gift to God, that would rank way up there, wouldn't it? I mean, 
worship is a really important thing. So you would think that Jesus would say, hey, if you find you've got this, you know, relationship that's broken um, and you're worshiping God, well, certainly continue and complete your act of devotion toward God, but then go take care of this relationship. That's not what Jesus says. In fact, he says the opposite. He says in verses 23 and 24, he says, I want you to interrupt your worship. I want you to leave your gift. I want you to leave the altar. I want you to leave the church. Get out of there and go deal with that relationship. Jesus says, for God, people come first. For God, relationships, treating people right, actually come first. That's how important this is. In other words, if I, if I knowingly allow an unreconciled relationship to just linger, if I indulge that, if there are amends that I know I need to make and yet I don't do that and I come into this place and I sing and I raise my hands and I wave banners and I play drums and I come and I put my offering in the box and I do you know all of that stuff but I haven't done what I need to do about that broken relationship I'm not pleasing God I am dishonoring God it made me wonder when I thought about this passage when Jesus was teaching this and and he was dead serious I wonder if people got up while he was talking I wonder while Jesus was talking if somebody thought, man, there's a brother in my life, there's a sister in my life that I've spoken badly to, or I've cheated, or I've, I've done something to damage that relationship. You know what? I need to leave and go take care of that. I wonder if that happened. In fact, I bet it did happen. And I don't think Jesus stood there and said, hey, wait a minute, I'm not done. Would you sit back down? I think Jesus said, yeah, go for it. Go, do that, take care of that. Friends, I'm dead serious when I say this. If in the midst of this conversation we're having this morning, if God lays something on your heart, someone on your heart, and gives you a clear path for which you need to go and begin reconciliation with that person you get up and you leave this place and I guarantee you we will cheer for you because in this place nobody's perfect we all have broken relationships we all have stuff going on and you know we're a me too church yeah me too I got that happening. But what I will also say is if you're not clear on how you need to make amends or or begin that process of reconciliation, there are some things we're going to talk about this morning that I think will help you. And so you may want to just stick around to get a game plan together. All right. So anyway, one way or the other. Um. God says reconciliation takes priority over worship. And that's huge. Um, His point is that whether you are the offender or the offended, you need to take initiative. When? As soon as possible. You don't delay. You don't postpone. Some of us have been putting this off for for days or weeks or sometimes even years. So the first thing we need to see from the scriptures regarding how to fight well, and there are going to be five points. So last week I gave you six points. This week we're going to have five. Cutting it down just a little bit. Um, 
the first thing we need to, to see is if we're going to fight well, we need to take initiative. We need to make it a priority and reach out to that person. And let me give you four quick suggestions. This is, this is four sub-points under point number one. All right. Four quick suggestions on how to, to take initiative well. First, choose the right time. The best time to have a conversation, a difficult conversation, is when you are both at your best. When you may be ready, but they may not be ready. And so you need to, you need to try to figure out a time when you're both at your best. And one way to do that is to come to that person and say, hey, you know, there's something I need to talk to you about. This is a, it's a difficult conversation that I think we need to have. Um, is now a good time to do that, or would there be a better time for you? You don't just walk in and, and you know, boom, you know, just club them with the truth. You... You say, hey, when would be a good time to do this? My wife does this so well, and I should know because she does it with me. Um, Honey, uh, is there a time when we could, you know, oh gosh, here we go again, you know. um, No, so, but that really helps set the stage for having a productive conversation. Second, choose the right place. Don't just pull somebody aside out in the lobby of the church and say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. Um, don't do it in a, in a crowded restaurant where there are people around. Find a place where there's some privacy where you can actually have an intimate, productive conversation. Third, pray before you have the conversation. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know how to say this. I don't, I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't have the right words here. And I need you to help me to say this in a way that will be life-giving and not life-sucking. Um, help me do this right. Fourth, come with a positive attitude. You want to come to work on the problem, not on the person. David, did you hear that? So often in conflict, we think the person is the problem. But that's not it. You see, what we need to do is create a a win-win where we say, the issue is out here. The issue's not you, the issue's not me, the issue is out here. So how do we together go after this thing? Now, you may say, well, Keith, what if they never want to talk? Great question. Full disclosure. This may come as a surprise to you, but I've actually had conflicts with people in my life. I know, I know. It's a surprise because I'm so, you know, kind and gentle. and, um, And over the years... Over the years, there have been times when I've been in conflict with people and I didn't even know what the conflict was about. And so I would try, I would, I would try to do what Jesus told me to do. I would reach out to them. I'd call them and leave voicemails. I'd text them with no response. I would, I would reach out, reach out, reach out, and they never would respond to me. And so what do you do with that? Well, I'm encouraged by what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 12. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. In other words, if somebody pushes your buttons, you don't push theirs. If somebody attacks you, you don't attack back. 
He says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice, Paul didn't just say, live at peace with everyone. God gives us two caveats. If it is possible... And as far as it depends upon you. See, God recognizes that there are some people who simply won't respond, and thus you won't be able to live at peace with them. No matter what you do, unresponsiveness makes it impossible to live in peace with them. Um, Similarly, Ever been in conflict with somebody that no matter what you did, you just couldn't please them? It didn't matter what you tried. You just could not please them. God recognizes that there are some people like that, and therefore it will be impossible to live at peace with them. If it's possible... Sometimes it's not possible. As far as it depends upon you, you can't control what somebody else, how someone else responds. All you can do is what Jesus said. You reach out, you take the initiative, you make reconciliation a priority, but if they are unresponsive or impossible to please, well, that's on them. That's not on you. Ken Sandy says, if others refuse to respond to your efforts to make peace, you can find comfort, and I would add freedom, in the knowledge that God is pleased with your obedience. See, when you have unresolved conflict, unresolved tension with someone, and you've done everything you can, then that's all you can do. But when you haven't done everything you can, as far as it depends on you, when you haven't done all you can to resolve it, then you are living in a state of bondage that keeps you from enjoying life. And that lack of freedom then is actually on you. Doesn't matter who the conflict is with, boss, spouse, co-worker, friend, no matter who it's with, you need to take initiative. Have you ever noticed that conflict is never resolved accidentally? It just isn't. So Jesus says, you go. Don't wait. You leave your gift and you go. You don't ignore the conflict. You don't take the flight option. You take the fight option. You put forth a determined effort and you move toward the conflict as far as it depends on you. So that's the first point. Don't worry, the others won't take quite as long. Um, The second thing we need to do if we're going to fight well is we need to own our part of the conflict. And we heard Andy talking about the fact that he... He didn't want to own it, and, and, and he was trying to rationalize where he was. Um, that's our natural inclination, not to own it. And this goes back, and we've talked about this a couple of times in this series. This goes back to, to Adam and Eve, doesn't it? When they did what was wrong, and they're in conflict with God, and God comes to them in the garden, remember what Adam said? It's not my fault. It's her fault. It's the woman that you gave me. See, God, it's not even just her fault. It's your fault because you gave her to me. See, we try to blame other people for what's going on. And I love how Rick Warren spells blame. He spells it be lame. (laughs) Because anytime you're blaming somebody else, you're just being lame. You're not owning your part. They may be 99% wrong, but even if you are only 1% wrong, 
You have to begin with humility and confess your part. You have to own your part of the conflict. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, we've mentioned this in this series where, you know, we want to take this speck out of somebody else's eye, but we got this railroad tie sticking out of our own eye. And, and Jesus says before you try to get the speck out, you got to get that log out of your own eye. It's about having humility, which we talked about two weeks ago. It's about owning my part in the conflict. Um, Humility is key in breaking relational log jams. You want a sentence that will help you break relational log jams? There's one person who said yes. You all like the log jams you're in? You want one sentence that will help you break it? Here it is. I'm sorry I was only thinking of myself. Let's read that together. (laughs) I'm sorry I was only thinking of myself. See, that wasn't so hard. I will guarantee you that if you will use that sentence, it will break the logjam free. May not be the end of the conflict. There may still be work to be done, but things will get moving when you do that. (coughs) <coughs> and let me just add here what I've said before. You ha- if you're going to own your part of the conflict, you have to avoid the words, if, but, and maybe. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. No, you did hurt their feelings. No if about it. I'm really sorry, but I was really tired, and if you hadn't have done what you said. Really? Is that owning it? You know, I'm, I'm so sorry I hurt you, but, you know, maybe if the... No. Get rid of if, but, and maybe. You just own it. To fight well, we take the initiative, we own our part, and third, you've got to listen well. Listen for their hurt. How do you listen for their hurt? James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You've got to listen. That's essential to diffusing conflict. And when I say listen, I don't mean listen to what they're saying so that you can formulate your best comeback. That's not listening. Listening is when you try to really understand where they're coming from, why they're coming from that place, why the hurt is so deep in them. That's what listening is. And if you will take to heart this one verse from James, if you put it into practice, it can save you thousands in counseling. In fact, you can just write me the check. I'll be fine with that. (laughs) When you have this verse in mind, it gives you the ability to better consider the other person's interests, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks. Here's the fourth thing. To fight well, you need to tell the truth tactfully. And again, this is another thing we talked about during the Life Hack series, being tactful with our words. Ephesians 4 says, speak the truth in love. You don't, you don't speak the truth with a club where you beat people up with it. You, you speak the truth in love. Proverbs twelve eighteen says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You, you may want to write this down. You are never persuasive when you are abrasive. You are never persuasive when you're abrasive. You tell the truth tactfully. Ephesians 4.29. How many of you have memorized this verse? I've challenged you to memorize it. 
I've used it so many times over the recent weeks. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. If you will commit that to memory and let the, the, the Lord sear that into you and, and that becomes a go-to, then that's going to help you when you're, when you're figuring out how to approach these difficult conversations. Uh, see, it's not just what we say that's important, but it's how we say it. Here's the last thing. If you're going to fight well, you have to focus on reconciliation, not resolution. Big difference. Reconciliation means reestablishing the relationship. Resolution means we no longer have a disagreement. Friends, it's okay to not agree on everything. Right? We are never going to have resolution on all the issues. But we can have reconciliation and have loving relationships without agreeing on everything. If you can disagree without being disagreeable, you know what you experience? Freedom. If you can have unity without uniformity, you know what that is? Freedom. If you can walk hand in hand without seeing eye to eye, you know what that is? Freedom. You don't have to agree on every issue to come to a reconciliation. By the way, if you focus on, uh, on, on the relationship and not the issue... What you're going to find is some of the issues just aren't worth fighting about. Some things are never going to change and we just need to let them go. And when you do that, do you know what you experience? Freedom. Friends, we live in a world that is filled with conflict. It is everywhere. It's all around us. And in the midst of that conflict, do you know what makes us look more like Jesus? When we are reconcilers. God sent Jesus to reconcile us to the Father. God took the initiative. He did all that He could as far as it depended upon Him. And even though we in our sin were totally responsible for the divide, He humbled Himself and He took ownership of the sin. He took our sin upon Himself. Um, He understood where we were hurting. And as He was hanging on the cross, He spoke the truth tactfully. Remember what He said? He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He could have said, Father, these stupid idiots are are crucifying the one who came to save them. That's true, but it's not tactful. And what Jesus did is he focused on, on reconciliation, reconciling us to the Father without getting into all of the details of all of the issues, he just said, no, I want them all to come to me. Friends, when we become reconcilers, we look amazingly like Jesus. It is always more freeing to resolve conflict than to dissolve relationship. It's not easier, but it's more freeing. And if you want to take the flight option, that's your choice. But you will live in bondage. If you take the fight option, if you put forth a determined effort, regardless of how the other person responds, guess what? You will be free. 
Let me pray for us. Jesus, I am so grateful that not only did you call us to this and challenge us with this and say, leave your worship and go and do this. Make this priority. Not only did you give us that challenge, but you modeled it for us. You showed us how to do it. And so, Lord, I pray that, that all of us, as we encounter conflict in our lives uh, regularly, I pray that we would be good students of this, that we would be practitioners of this, and that we would recognize that as long as we live, show us in what we experience around the table. I pray that you will show us one more time what you did to reconcile us to you so that we can live in the freedom for which you came to give us. For your name's sake, I pray. Amen. So we are... We're going to come to the, the table this morning, and if you're visiting with us this morning, we're thrilled that you're here, and I'd just like to tell you what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, we participate in the Lord's Supper every week because it really is the, it is the celebration of why we come together. We don't come... I mean, everything that we do in here as a community of faith really should be, if it doesn't, it really should be pointing to the, to the table in which we remember what Jesus did for us. And so how we do it is we have four stations, there are two in the back and two in the front, and if those who are serving would go to those uh, tables right now. The, the server, there, we will gather around the, the tables in groups of, of three or four or five. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look around the table and you don't know somebody at the table, just introduce yourself because we, this is a family event. So as you go to the table, the ushers will, will point you to the table that, that you can go to. As you gather around, the server will offer you the bread and you take a, a little piece and, and then hold that so that we can take it together and, and the server will say, the body of Christ broken for you, let's eat together. And so you eat and, and it's, a, it's a communal thing. That's why we call it communion. It is our common union in Jesus. And then we take the cup, and, and the cup represents the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. And as we take that cup, the, the server will say, uh, the, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's drink together. And we drink that to celebrate what Jesus did to, to reconcile us to the Father. So as we come, let's, let's celebrate this and let's be reflective on, on what he did. And there will be some, there's some words on the screen that you can um, be thinking about and praying about, some, just some reflection during communion. And, um, and then the praise team will also lead us in, in praise. And then we'll come back to our seats and we'll dismiss and then we'll go bounce on things and eat things. So let's come to the table.
together.
Am I allowed to say, this is really good stuff? And we, if we can step into it, it will change our life, it'll change our community, it'll just, it will free us. Um, over the next couple of three weeks, um, Gwen's on next week, and she's going to take us through um, the the belief cycle, and then um, Julie's on after that. She's going to take us through the grace pathway, and then Diane is on after that. She's going to talk about um, building walls or creating boundaries because there's a difference. Um, and then hopefully I'll be out of bed and I'll be back with you. So there's, there's that. Um, we believe in the power of prayer. And so we have... Uh, some committed, uh, devoted prayers in our church, and they're going to come down and be down front and would, would love to pray with you about anything going on in your lives. The, the prayer corps prayed before the service and, and gave the Lord, or the Lord gave them four words for us today. Empty chair. I don't know if that resonates with you in any way, but if it does, that is God's prompting to say you need to be prayed for. Um, spirit of timidity. I don't know if you struggle with being timid, but maybe God's calling you to be prayed for that. Don't look back. And finally, camera. Now, sometimes we've had some kind of strange off-the-wall words, and yet God has spoken through those words to call people. And so I encourage you, if any of these words resonate with you, come and allow our, our prayer team to pray with you. If you are, uh, we're going to go out and enjoy a great time of fellowship. And, and let me just give you a, a word of hospitality. If you are outside and you see someone that does not look familiar Go and greet them because it is likely they are visiting. And we want to, we're throwing this party for visitors so that we can just say to our neighborhood, we love you guys. Um, and so go and let's have a great time of, of hospitality outside and just have some fun with each other and folks who would visit. And if you are playing basketball, <coughs> if you're in the basketball game, you need to be on court at 115. Okay? 115. Uh, yes, sir. So, we've had a couple of people that wanted to pray specifically for Keith or just our church visits coming up. So, when we get dismissed here in just a second, if you'd like to come down and do that, um, I'm pretty sure he'd appreciate it. <laughs> so let me uh, let me dismiss us so we can go and enjoy and oh and by the way food trucks are on you Kona ice is on us so let's go out with these words from the Apostle Paul this morning if it is possible as far as it depends on me live at peace with everyone Amen. We're dismissed.